and welcome to the Oddity Archive. This show that's the most whack thing on the internet. And somehow I fear that might soon become literal, specifically involving my kneecaps. But in spite of that, today I want to drag you down a pretty serious rabbit hole. So uh, somehow I started out with one of my personal favorite so-called bad TV record offer commercials. And somehow I ended up with quite possibly the definitive fake it till you make it story. So with that, today, uh, since we're talking music here, I want to deliver the ballad of Peter Lemon Jello. And yes, that is his real name. And yes, that is how you pronounce it. In this two-album package, Love 76, you'll experience all the warmth and tenderness living in the heart of Peter Lemangelo. It's no secret that I've long held an interest in oddball albums and bad local commercials, so today's episode kinda melds the two worlds together. With that, back in 1976, the New York City TV airwaves were saturated, especially during the overnight hours, with a record offer touting some Kermit the Frog-voiced Engelbert Humperdinck clone with an equally funny name, Peter Lemon Jello. I initially assumed this was the work of some minor record label that was trying to clear house on those last copies of some minor artist who was on his way out. I couldn't have been more wrong. For records or 8.98 for eight-track tape to Love 76. A little caveat before we begin, I've got a ton of info on Peter Lemon Jello, of which I would say it's about one-third true, one-third exaggeration, and one-third fabricated. I've done my best to average everything out for this episode, but I make no guarantees with regards to accuracy. And of course, my opinions will factor in at times. Anyway, Peter Lemangelo, originally spelled with an I, was born in Jersey City, New Jersey on February 11, 1947. In 1954, the family moved to North Babylon, Long Island, or a Long Island if you're local, where Peter developed a fondness for music, but not the burgeoning rock world. Lemangelo's heart very much belonged to the Italian crooner scene, uh, Tony Bennett, etc. Nonetheless, Lemangelo's entry into music was rather roundabout. Lemangelo took up the drums and played with Scotty Hamer's North Babylon Stage Band. According to Scotty, Lemangelo was brought on more for his ability to work up the audience than his drumming. What a difference it makes, 24 hours. Welcome to the United States Army. And a man with about a million stripes on his arm gave us a speech. One of the things he said was that now that we were in the Army, a bathroom would be called a latrine. In 1966, Lemangelo was drafted into the U.S. Army. Lemangelo managed to talk his way out of being sent to the Vietnam front line by, well, lying about his education, but more importantly, touting his as-yet-untested vocal skills. By some miracle, the higher-ups agreed that Lemangelo was more valuable as part of the USO and wrote out his hitch working out his eventual lounge act while on tour. Depending on your source, both being Peter Lemangelo himself, he either arrived home after his hitch and started unsuccessfully hitting up every talent agent in New York, or was enjoying a six-month R&R in Hawaii, where at some point he attended a Don Ho concert. When Ho asked if anyone in the audience thought they could do better than him, Lemangelo accepted the challenge, 
outsang Don Ho, and impressed the man so much that he offered the services of his own management once his military hitch ended. Lemon Jello took up the offer. My money, says Peter, wound up pounding the pavement back in New York. Then we were joined by the Vietnamese ladybird, Madam Key. And here's our ambassador, Ellsworth Bunker. As best as I can gather, Peter's military hitch ended in 1968, whereupon he began sweet-talking his way into performing at any nightclub that would have him, at first under the name Johnny Barron. Of course, the work was sparse, so he moonlighted as an egg salesman. Then parlayed that into buying a couple of gas stations, which also sold his eggs, not a joke, which he parlayed into a few laundromats, which he parlayed into a home construction business. By early 1971, Lemon Jello settled into something of a groove as a lounge singer, with reasonably regular gigs in and around New York City, as well as in the Catskills. In other words, Lemon Jello made it to the Borscht Belt, his natural musical home. At the same time, Lemon Jello had already managed to get three singles out the door. One for, probably his own, Stereo Media Records, using his original name spelling no less. One for Mark V, or maybe V, uh, but we're not talking about the old religious label. And one for the newly formed, short-lived, Rare Bird Records organized by Joseph Colombo Sr., who'd been accused of running a major mafia crime family. And when Colombo personally made an appearance, the cheers were loud. God, that I was born of Italian birth! No later than 1971, Lemon Jello managed to somehow hook up with mafioso Joseph Joe Colombo. Colombo had a large hand in creating the Italian-American Civil Rights League uh, to end negative Italian stereotypes, and in creating the movie adaptation of The Godfather. According to Lemon Jello, who simultaneously denies any mob ties, Colombo got him a part as a wedding singer in the movie. I can't find him anywhere in that scene. Lemon Jello has alternately claimed that he's in the movie, got cut out of the movie, and most likely got drummed out of the movie because of his ties to Joe Colombo. Incidentally, at the same time the movie was being made, Colombo was shot, and as a result paralyzed, at the second annual Italian Unity Day, which was held by his organization at which point his bodyguards open fired on and killed Colombo's assailant. So much for ending bad Italian stereotypes. Ladies and gentlemen, Peter Lemoncello! Our own program is brought to you in living color on NBC. After a necessary management change, Lemon Jello was asked to appear on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, with Joey Bishop filling in for Carson. Lemon Jello has often claimed that he made 25 appearances on The Tonight Show. I can only find three confirmed appearances, none of which Carson is present for, all as an end of show filler. This was no accident. Lemon Jello's new manager also happened to be comedian Don Rickles' manager, and Rickles had some ties to Bishop as well. Lemon Jello also happened to be Rickles' regular opening act for two years, and two out of Lemon Jello's three confirmed Tonight Show appearances featured Rickles' guest hosting for Carson, both on the same week. <laughs> During the Rickles period, Lemon Jello inked a deal with Epic Records, a three-record deal, as in three singles. While Lemon Jello seemingly recorded three individual songs for the label, only one was released, never making it beyond a promotional pressing. That one single, Mary Lee, same on both sides, is 
pretty decent. Shame the only currently circulating copy runs at an erratic speed. She was a wild, wild woman. My first, my last. My everything By 1975, Lemon Jello managed to build up an impressive run of talk show appearances, including The Merv Griffin Show, The Dinah Shore Show, and The Mike Douglas Show, four times. Problem was, Lemon Jello's brand of music was falling especially out of favor by 1975, and the Borscht Belt was starting to decline. And, worst of all, the world already had an Engelbert Humperdinck, a Tony Bennett, a Dean Martin, a Frank Sinatra, and so on. All alive, well, and active at the time. As something of a last-ditch effort to break out of the Borscht Belt, Lemon Jello decided it was time to go indie, in a very unique way. Somehow Lemon Jello managed to raise, depending on which story you believe, somewhere between $250,000 and $390,000. $50,000 was to go towards cutting a full, polished album, about $20,000 to manufacturing somewhere approaching 20,000 copies of said album, and the rest going to making and airing a TV record offer commercial. As for the album, Lemon Jello managed to corral songwriter Teddy Randazzo, who wrote some of Little Anthony and the Imperials hits, into producing a 10-track studio album. To show off both sides of Lemon Jello's musical personality, the project ballooned into a double album, a more contemporary, easy-listening-minded studio disc, and a live album, consisting of existing recordings, that would show the man in full lounge lizard mode. What a difference a day makes 24 little hours In the sun, the showers Where there used to be rain Do I love you? Don't you know by now? Since we're here, I suppose I ought to give a little rundown of my thoughts on Love 76. So, we've already discussed this, it's a double album, and to hammer the idea home, in the gatefold, each disc is assigned its own name, disc 1 being Born to be in Love with You, disc 2 being On Stage, and I found both discs maddening in their own special way. The studio disc consists of 10 cuts, 8 uh, pretty flat, tired and cliched Teddy Randazzo originals, a rendition of Paul Anka's 1971 near-hit, Do I Love You, and a rendition of Skylark's 1973 hit, Wildflower. All ten cuts follow an ultra-similar, ultra-dated mid-70s groove, uh, to the point where it immediately evokes mental images of shag carpeting and wood veneer. Anyway, the Anka cover is too similar to the original to make a mark, and the Skylark cover strips the hit of its groove, and pretty much everything else in the process. To me, the only real keeper was actually one of the Teddy Randazzo tunes. Can't get you off my mind, if only because it's kind of catchy. Now, this tune happened to be the only single pulled from the project, so <laughs> apparently I can hear the hit. And speaking of hits, you could totally stick this one on a 70s kitsch hits playlist, and no one would bat an eye. But I can't get you off my mind. No matter what I do, I just can't get you off my mind. If nothing else, the live half feels somewhat more representative of Lemon Jello's style. When he goes full-on schlockmeister, uh, a la what a difference a day makes, it's pretty lame, but it's the least awkward. 
but the live disc winds up flopping, largely thanks to bad song choices. When Lemon Jello goes more contemporary, which is over half of it, it's downright horrid. Songs by Barry White, The Ides of March, Jim Croce, Kiki D, and others get absolutely massacred. As much as I hate telling an artist to stay in their lane, in this case, I think that sentiment is well-deserved. As of this episode, the entire double LP is on YouTube twice over for your perusal. Uh, it's the moment of truth. You are about to witness a new dimension in entertainment. Peter Lemongello. A short teaser ad went into rotation, mostly late at night, at the beginning of 1976, only on New York City TV stations. By February, these were replaced with a full two-minute ad. As best as I can gather, while copies of the album were also sent to radio stations for airplay and publications for review, all in New York, the album garnered very little airplay and a big fat zero reviews, so the commercial did all the work. Despite everything, the album moved somewhere between 20 and 30,000 copies in its first three months, affording Lemon Jello the notoriety to start putting on some proper concerts around town. By April, the commercial started airing in Los Angeles, to, as best as I can gather, a resounding thud. By the end of May, according to a Time Magazine article, the album had nonetheless sold some 43,000 copies total, mostly in and around New York. That same month, Private Stock Records, a, a little more on them later, signed Lemon Jello to a four-year deal. And so, Lemon Jello wound down the TV campaign and focused on album number two. Stone Smash Records. Oh, wow. Stone Smash ah. Records. And, and it's commercial. Here, here. And all the way, so. Oh, let's do okay, it. Okay, my friend. Okay. We're gonna do it. That's what I get for loving you. To this day, Lemon Jello likes to claim that Love 76 sold between 1 and 1.7 million copies. I can guarantee you this is a total lie. Anyway, at my most generous, I would say that once all was said and done, Love 76 sold at best around 60,000 copies, and this is assuming we're not playing the music industry game of counting each copy of the double album as two records sold. Anyway, to crunch the numbers a bit, let's give Lemon Jello the fullest benefit of the doubt here. Lemon Jello claimed that the total budget was $390,000 and that each copy of the album cost $1.05 to manufacture. The 8-track version would have cost more to produce, but we'll just leave that number at $1.05 a unit. We'll say that, keeping with the averages of the time, the album sold about 75% on vinyl at $6.98 a copy and 25% on 8-track at $8.98 a copy. Assuming that Triad Media Associates, who was handling the TV stuff, didn't get a cut of each unit sold, the album grossed, after costs, $385,800 against a $390,000 budget. The album lost $4,200, at the very least. In other words, he needed to be a serious concert draw to offset the lack of record sales. I have a new one for you. Who is Peter Lemon Jello? Come with me. Well, you can't say the commercials didn't get Lemon Jello some attention. In a May 1976 episode of NBC's Saturday Night, now Saturday Night Live, Chevy Chase spoofed Lemon Jello as Peter Lemon Mood Ring, mashing together Lemon Jello's name, his alleged mood rock genre, and the then-ongoing Mood Ring fad. Chevy would also reprise the proper name in one of the later Fletch movies. And that's about where the fun and games ended. 
At the same time as Lemon Jello's record deal, his concerts, and his regional notoriety, Lemon Jello's wife filed for divorce. Did I mention he'd gotten married in 1968? Lemon Jello put his Islip Long Island home up for sale and, perhaps prematurely, headed for Hollywood. For a few years, he called himself Johnny Barron. And nobody say, ever said, Who's Johnny Barron? I was going to say, Lime Jello would attract more people. <laughs> well, I, I think his name is, you know, a, a tremendous positive at the moment. Over the summer of 1976, Lemon Jello was met with a lawsuit from Triad Media Associates. Triad claimed he owed $95,000 for their TV work and that Lemon Jello had way overreported his record sales, claiming only 20,000 copies had been sold as opposed to Lemon Jello's figure of 50,000. On a related note, Triad had already been blamed for 8,000 unfilled orders and as such passed the buck to Lemon Jello, who, by court order, was given until the end of September to fulfill those 8,000 orders. In November, Lemon Jello's first and last album for Private Stock Records was released, Do I Love You? And yes, it's the same Paul Anka tune from Love 76, just in a new recording, which also happened to be pulled as the album's single. Now, I can't find any figures, but I'd be willing to bet heavily that the album sold worse than Love 76. At the very least, neither the LP nor the single charted. In 1977, Lemon Jello was sent on tour with label mate Walter Murphy of A Fifth of Beethoven fame. The notices were less than glowing. Private Stock, which was on the skids itself and closed in late 78, dropped Lemon Jello after less than a year on the roster. To add insult to injury, in November, Lemon Jello was slapped with a group lawsuit from several music publishers, claiming he hadn't paid mechanical royalties for all the cover tunes on Love 76. Uh, kind of important when you're putting cover tunes on your record. While I can't confirm anything, it looks like the publishers wanted a total of $1 per album, a $5,000 lump sum for each tune, and court costs. Peter Lemongello's Lemon music career was officially over. Let the rain fall down. By the early 80s, Lemongello wound up relocating to Florida, where he restarted his home construction business with brother Mike, uh, himself a fallen pro bowler, in tow. In January of 82, Peter and Mike were kidnapped by cousin Mark Lemongello, himself a fallen and legendarily hot-headed Major League Baseball pitcher. The reason? Mark felt he'd been cheated out of a $43,000 investment in the family construction business. Mark and a fellow ex-Houston Astro took the brothers at gunpoint to the bank to withdraw said $43,000. Mark and his friend proceeded to run off with the money, only to turn themselves in less than a week later. Mark was sentenced to seven years probation. That summer, Peter Lemangelo himself was arrested, charged with two counts of arson. The going story is that Peter was upset about some deal with his construction, set up an employee to burn down the homes he'd been working on for insurance and revenge purposes. The employee allegedly refused and later talked to the police, and Lemangelo allegedly proceeded to do the dirty work himself. Lemangelo proceeded to not only deny the allegations, but proclaim that the county authorities just wanted to have a convicted famous person to their name. Given the location, I'd be willing to bet no one at the sheriff's department had ever heard of him. I'm looking for the love I had with you. 
Lemon Jello claimed he attempted suicide in the early 90s. Whether or not his survival was his motivation to get back into music is unknown. Nonetheless, Lemon Jello took off to Branson, Missouri, where he managed to reprise his old lounge act, and apparently fairly successfully, until Branson started falling out of favor in the mid to late 90s, at which point Lemon Jello returned to Florida. Soon thereafter, Lemon Jello remarried and had a son, Peter Lemon Jello Jr. Like his father, Jr. has since proven himself to be a genuine man out of time. Now when you snap your fingers or wink your eye, I come running to you. Run I'm tired to your apron string. Anyone who sees her since the early 2000s, Lemon Jello Sr. has periodically recorded, including some wrong-headed attempts at making his sound more contemporary. He's made some live appearances up and down the East Coast, managed to guest host on Sirius XM's Seriously Sinatra channel a few times, and has seemingly managed Junior's career. Speaking of which, in 2017, Junior, officially but not really, attempted to put on a doo-wop slash early rock and roll festival, largely consisting of acts with only one surviving original member. Apparently, nobody told some of the artists. The show was promoted featuring a handful of artists that were not only nowhere to be found, but were apparently oblivious to the show. Of the artists that showed, they were guaranteed a certain amount of money to perform. When the audience was smaller than expected, an estimated 150, the Lemon Jellos attempted to pay the artists with what they collected at the door, which was nowhere near their contracted amount. Some artists refused to perform, which was just as well. Apparently, the sound crew was only on call until 5 p.m., at which time they proceeded to start tearing down as some of the acts that were willing to perform were still performing. Since then, Junior was the de facto frontman of The Crests of 16 Candles fame, from 2017 to 18, he's appeared with the current incarnations of the Four Tops and a few others, and damned if I know how or why. And again, yes, I have reason to believe that Lemon Jello Sr. is manager. In other words, as of my making this, the Lemon Jello train rolls on. If nothing else, I truly admire Peter Lemongello's uh, chutzpah, if you will. But having said that, I think I figured out pretty early on what his main failing was. So, uh, within the realm of music or acting or whatever, anything where there's that potential of fame and fortune and being able to live long enough to enjoy it, uh, you have that moment eventually where you realize that you aren't going to make it, as it were. I mean, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like winning the lottery. But that's the point at which you just start, within the realm of music, just playing and or singing at home for your own enjoyment, or you form the crappy little band with some friends and you go and maybe play the odd bar gig, or you become a home recording geek, <laughs> guilty, and you just do it because it's your thing. It's your love. But I don't think Peter Lemongello loved the music half as much as he loved certainly the prospect of fame and fortune. And I think that was his undoing. And I'm not entirely convinced he's learned that lesson quite yet. But anyway, that's it for today's archive. Join me next time when I, I'm probably going to be a little on edge because I woke up next to a severed horse head. I don't own any horses.
I'm